Hey everyone, today we are with Shalen, who is our business consultant here in Dubai, and she helped us set our company up here in Dubai around two and a half years ago. Now we did a video around seven months ago, it was 45 minutes, all about the details of setting up a company here, if you're relocating to Dubai, what you need to know. So if you are thinking of moving here, we'll add a Google form in the description. And if you fill out those details, Shellen will get in touch. Since the first video, we had a great reaction from you guys and lots of questions have come through since then. In our own life as well, the business has progressed and we're thinking further ahead. So within this episode today, we're gonna to introduce Shellen and go through some more perhaps advanced topics or topics that can be looked at further down your business career in Dubai. So welcome Shellen. Thank you for having me again. I'm really looking forward to this. Obviously the last one had a great response from everyone, a lot of inquiries, but now we are seeing the need for the more complex structuring. So I think this will bit give your viewers a lot more clarity on kind of how they can approach this and the benefits of doing the more advanced stuff in the UAE. I agree. And initially, for those that have discovered this video, and perhaps you haven't watched the previous one, we will link that down in the description below if you want to check it out. But initially, Shelley, can you go through a summary of the different types of business businesses that you can have in Dubai, the different types of setup? Yeah, absolutely. So obviously, you've got normal operating companies, which you guys are familiar with, because you've obviously gone through the motions. Uh, the two different routes is free zone or mainland, depending on which business you're doing, how you're going to be operating, who you're targeting, and kind of what the, the short, medium and long term plan is for those businesses. So the UAE has multiple free zones throughout the whole of the UAE. So there's a lot of options. It can be a bit overwhelming at times, but that's why I've still got a job. So happy days. Um, the kind of more advanced stuff, which is I know what we're going to focus a bit more on today is more the restructuring, asset protection, the succession planning vehicles. So a lot of people around the world will be familiar with trusts. Um, in the UAE, we're probably more focused on foundations. Uh, there's SPVs, holding companies. So hopefully this kind of conversation will give people a bit more information a bit more clarity on what the differences are and see maybe if it might suit them as well yeah i think so and a word there spv stands for special purpose vehicle if you guys have been following us for a long time on our personal real estate journey summer and i you know that we've purchased properties in the uk and we set up a limited company to do that too for for tax reasons there and i think a lot of people are of course investing in real estate in dubai but what we're looking to explore is how to actually structure that, particularly for large purchases or acquisitions of a lot of real estate. There's certain rules and regulations here that are going to be different to your home culture. So that's what we're here to try and understand today. There's been new tax laws, was it last July, that have come into yeah. Dubai. So can you share what they are? So there is corporate tax now. Um, this isn't as applicable for the SPVs holding companies foundations because they are obviously passive vehicles. This is more relating to the operating companies which you guys are aware of as well. There is SME relief and there's different things that come into play and the tax is only 9%. So for people like us who come from the UK and should I say less friendly tax environments, it's still not that bad. Yeah. But there are ways to alleviate that as well as there is in every other tax unfriendly jurisdiction, shall we say. For so sure. yes, there is 9% corporate tax. Um, there is a, th a threshold, mm -hmm. but then there are other things that come into play as well, depending on what kind of business you are running, where you're operating, how you're operating, but tax experts can kind of delve into that. But yeah, 9% or zero. And then small business relief, you mentioned SME relief mm -hmm. for those that aren't quite sure. What is the threshold currently and who would be a typical person that would fall into that small business category? So there is a kind of turnover cap. So if you, I think it's 3 million dirhams, if I'm not mistaken, if you're turning over 3 million dirhams, um, the government have released an initiative to support the smaller businesses with these new tax implications. One thing that I have found with Dubai and having our business here, there's a wealth of opportunity, but some parts of it can seem complex, yeah. especially to start with. I wouldn't say there's easy guidance on like one size fits all. It seems like you have to delve and research into what's specific for you and, and really understanding what type of business you are or individual 
and whether then a free zone or mainland is going to be best. But that is looking at more of the entry level stuff. And yeah. as we said in within this episode, we want to go into more um, advanced asset protection. Shellen, for our viewers then to get a bit of clarity, obviously you're a consultant here in Dubai, you're offering expertise on, on various topics, but the individual elements of setting up a business you might not focus on. So tell us more about where your role comes in and how particularly you can help those that are looking to move to Dubai. Yeah, absolutely. So obviously I cannot be an expert in absolutely everything, but my role is to piece together a solution for my clients that can support them in the short, the long, the medium, whatever the plan is for either asset protection, setting up a new business, whatever the kind of goal is. Um, I'm very open and honest with pretty much everyone as you guys would have experienced anyway. If I don't know anything, I will tell you and I will bring an expert in that can support and build on the knowledge. I've got the base knowledge on pretty much everything and all the ins and outs, but what we do is so bespoke. You know, every individual is different where they operate in the world is different, where their assets are, the types of assets they've got, all of those things will impact what we choose to do for you and what we set up ultimately. And I cannot pretend to know absolutely everything about everything. So the great thing about where we are and how we're set up is even if we don't have an expert in house, we have so many people that we can contact. You know, we've got our own tax division, who we introduce pretty much every single one of our clients to, especially now. Um, we've got recruitment support. We've got, you know, overseas tax advice. We've got offshore jurisdictions where we can structure different things to suit different clients because everything that we are all doing is so different. You know, some of the solutions might overlap, but, you know, our lives don't look the same. So there's never going to be a kind of one solution suits all. So my role is very much ask a lot of questions, answer as much as I can. And if I can't answer it, introduce them to the right person that can. Now, before we take a deep dive into high level corporate structures, SPVs, asset protection, I think it's really important to acknowledge getting the basics right first. And I'm saying that myself, because when we expanded our business here there was so much to learn we didn't really know where to start which is partly why we're so grateful for the guidance we've had and why we want to share that with you so if i am someone wanting to expand my business or set up a new business in dubai what are my options as a complete overview starting from the basics so obviously this is again very much an individual situation depends on the business depends on what the plan is i have a lot of clients that do just want residency and don't necessarily want to run a business you know they're fortunate enough not to need it or have income from elsewhere and they don't necessarily need an entity which is fine um 90 percent of those still end up setting up a, a business license just to be able to sponsor their visa um this is probably going to sound like a foreign language to a lot of people that aren't familiar with the UAE, but I'll try and make it as simple as possible. So the two types of operating entities, as you guys know, is free zone, mainland. So mainland, each emirate has its own. The free zone, however, there are so many. I think there's over 50 now throughout the UAE. Um, different free zones specialize in different industries. So depending on what you're going to be doing, you know, there's DIFC in Dubai, for example, which is the financial center. You've got DMCC again in Dubai that focuses on commodities. Um, then you've got some of the more generic ones. So we've got a really, really great entry level type free zone, for example, in Dubai, which is Maidan. So we are partnered with them. It's one of our managed free zones. So we have a bit more input there and it goes very, very well. Um, but that's a really nice kind of entry level for someone that wants an entity within Dubai that's not a specialist industry. It works quite well. Um, so in terms of that, for example, I've got clients that have set up there purely for visas that aren't really going to be running much of a business, maybe the odd invoice here and there, but it's more for the invoice. I mean, sorry, more for the visa angle. So there's other clients that aren't particularly fussed about their license being in Dubai, which is fine because we've got some of the Northern Emirates, which are a bit more cost effective as well, which allows that visa for the residency and makes life easy as well. So it, everyone's different, but this is more the entry level. So the free zones, um, 
just for visa purposes, this is generally the way that we go. Uh, if it's just for visas, uh, you've got different routes as well. So there's like the golden visa route. So if you're already in the UAE and you're earning minimum 30,000 dirhams a month, for example, we can go straight in with an application for a golden visa. If you've got investment here and some cash that you're, you know, putting into property or whatever, we can go down that route as well. There are different options with the golden visa. For people who are not necessarily looking to set up a business, but just want residency, want to live in the sunshine, be around happy people and not pay tax on anything. Um, as an individual, I should add now, not mm -hmm. the corporate side, um, then we do have options as well. Typically it's the, the company route, but there are alternatives as well. So mainland is probably a bit more established locally. So you can work freely with Free zones, other mainland companies, the government, internationally, there's there's no limitations, to be honest. So it's a bit more of a kind of fully fledged entity, as you guys are aware. There's no restrictions. You're pretty free to just go and work however you want to work. Um, visas are exactly the same length of time for everything. Forget the golden visa and investment routes, because those are different lengths. But every visa is two years. So whether it's an investment or an employee visa within the UAE, immigration issue two year visas, which are renewable. So as we know, you go and do a medical test, um, you do your x-ray and your blood test, go through the motions there, get your visa issued, get your updated Emirates ID, which is gold here because you need that for absolutely everything as we know again. Um, so yeah, the, the visas are two years, but the business license. So for example, when there are clients who like yourselves are expanding your businesses into the UAE or even moving it all together or setting up something completely brand new, we can go down any of those routes. The business license length can be pretty much any time that they want. So I've got clients who have come here and set up a business license for 10 years because they know for the next 10 years, they're gonna be invoicing from here, whether they're living here or not. You know, if it becomes a bit less frequent and they're kind of going to other countries, because obviously here geographically, it's a great location to work with the neighboring countries. So it can work quite well, even if their longer term plan is to reduce the time here anyway. But like I said, the visas are renewed every two years, unless we go for something like a golden visa, which is a 10 year. Uh, sometimes the investor ones are five years. It, it depends. And once you have the visa secured and once you've been through the medical and all of that application, the renewal process is fairly simple. It's more a process of paying the, the annual fee. And then you have everything like that set up. So I think as an overview of that, some fantastic information there, it really comes down to your goal. Is the goal to move to Dubai live here, have a lifestyle, but you're very content with your business or income elsewhere. And that may may uh, result in a free zone being ideal for you, or you're actually looking to set up a business here and really make the most of the opportunity for business in the UAE. I mean, that can't be forgotten, not just Dubai. Yeah. The surrounding Emirates, there's obviously a lot going on at the moment, a lot of expansion. Yeah. And I think a lot of people will be considering business here, not just for the lifestyle that Dubai offers, but actually for the direct business opportunity. So it really all comes down to your individual goal, which again, why it's worth connecting with Jelen and going through on a call or something from your home country, what specifically you're looking for. Yeah, because I wanted to touch on the, if you are interested obviously speaking with Shellen, they don't need to come and visit Dubai to see you. You can do it all over Zoom. Is it up until the medical exam that they have to be in Dubai for? So it depends what we're structuring, of course. Um, but the majority of entities we can set up remotely. So I think there's been quite a few clients, especially that have come through our last podcast that I've never actually met, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. We end up just speaking on the phone on WhatsApp a lot. WhatsApp's a huge thing here, guys, in the <laughs> UAE, so you've got to adjust. Um, but yeah, it's either WhatsApp, phone calls, emails, and a lot of Teams calls, you know, Teams, Zoom, and a lot of it is done like that. The initial aspect, like you quite rightly mentioned, can be done remotely. The only part that we can't really do anything about is the visa part. I mean, yeah, the medical part of the yeah. visa. They do have to physically be here. Passport has to be in the country, sent to the immigration office. But other than that, 
the majority of the process we can do remotely, which works quite well for a lot of our clients who are extremely busy, don't necessarily live very close, Mm -hmm. have other businesses running in different countries. You know, not everyone has time to just come to the UAE for a month and figure everything out. So that was a really good overview. I mean, shall we deep dive a bit more into the advanced yeah I think so let's look now let's fast forward you have your mainland or free zone entity here perhaps you've been established in Dubai for a number of years business is going well which is great that's what we all want and you'd perhaps like to start looking at structuring or some investment opportunities be that real estate or anything else what are your options or where maybe specifically you can come in and help individuals with regards to that as a higher level next step So this isn't as straightforward as just setting up a business because obviously it's a bit easier. Once we understand what business you're going to be doing, how you're going to be operating, who you're going to be approaching, which countries you're targeting, all of those kind of things, that's relatively easy. When it comes to the next few steps, it's a bit more in depth. The consultations are a bit more complex, tend to need to bring people in who specialize in tax implications from their home country, for example. Passports come into play here. There are a few different passports who have worldwide tax implications. So we need to consider that when we're structuring anything as well. Um, So this is just, I guess my disclaimer guys, initially (laughs) how we start out. But there are different things that you can do. It really, really depends. So again, this is very bespoke, but depending on the types of assets that they've got, so whether it's shares in businesses, intellectual property, they could own a yacht, they could own, you know, there's so many different asset types that it dep- that will impact what the suggestion is. Um, but we've got different vehicles. So these are more passive vehicles rather than actual operating companies where you invoice for a service. So SPV, which we mentioned earlier, a special uh, purpose vehicle. They have different names in different jurisdictions, but I'm just going to say special purpose vehicle for now because they all pretty much work the same, but just slightly different names and variations. So SPVs, for example, it's the clues in the name with that one. It's designed for a special purpose. So sometimes our clients will structure. I think I want to do this bit backwards and get everyone a bit mixed up, but If you've got different asset classes, for example, you may want to structure them under separate SPVs to mitigate the financial risk on the rest of the assets. So I've got certain clients with businesses in more high risk industries. Construction, for example, if you're constructing huge buildings and stuff like that, the liability and the the chance of something coming back to you is higher than if you've got a marketing company, for example random example guys but that's no it makes sense yeah. and protecting your assets is vitally important and that's where it's really going to be useful i think to dive into this more just separating the liability and managing yes. the risk a little bit is typically what people will use spvs for yeah. then you've got a holding company which is a bit more of a generic upgraded version of an SPV, I guess. I'm trying to keep this really simple mm. for everyone well, to Well, how about understand. who would typically benefit from a holding company? Could, for example, Summer and I, so we're looking to, let's say, purchase a property here in Dubai. Mm-hmm. We could just buy that in our individual name. Yep. Would there be any, any benefit to setting up an SPV for that? Well, if you're going to set up an SPV, then it really kind of depends would it just be for, be for the one property? Are you planning on expanding? Are you yeah, planning on living in the U, uh, UAE for the foreseeable future? It's a good question. Let's say for the purpose of this example, it's an investment property yep. and we plan to buy five more over the next 12 months. Mm-hmm. So in the UK and in America too, then there are often benefits with setting up a limited company specifically to own that, yeah. particularly to protect yourself from litigation. I'm not sure how common that is here in the UAE, but certainly in America, I mean, you it's have very the same common. benefits, of course. But yeah. yeah. So let's say we're going to, okay, we would like to purchase five them. investment <laughs> properties and we'd like them to be within 50 50 ownership between Summer and I, but protect them and have that separate to our individual names. Build a portfolio in the UAE. You guys are free as a bird at the moment. You could end up anywhere. 
So from a tax perspective, I'd probably say individually, you might want to consider that. I know if you went back to the UK and you were receiving rental income in the from here in the UK, there are tax implications. So putting it in a corporate entity means that the money can go back in and be reinvested. That's number one. From the tax side of things, the passive vehicles have more beneficial tax implications. So again, for you guys, that's something to consider on a local basis as well. So uh, another benefit, I guess, would be that a lot of us living in the UAE aren't necessarily following Sharia law. Obviously, a lot of us from the Western world aren't necessarily familiar or following the same kind of rules. So something like that, again, it's beneficial to have most of the the SPVs and the holding companies, sorry, I'm jumping from information and assuming you guys have everything, but the holding companies, SPVs, foundations, all of those things that we look at are set up in offshore jurisdictions, which means that it can follow UK common law as opposed to Sharia law. So for expats who are now living in the Middle East, these things tend to be quite important because it's a legal system that we're more familiar with. You know, if there was an issue, it's the assets are owned by a UK common law jurisdiction based uh, vehicle. So again, we're more familiar, easier process. Mm -hmm. Uh, They tend to have their own in-house courts as well in the jurisdictions that we work with, which makes life easier if there were any problems. Again, this is all kind of worst case scenarios. I think it's a really great point though to highlight and the fact that the UK law or the law in your home country that you're specifically used to can be very different to local law. So let's just use a similar example to last time because I do think it's very relevant for people watching. And I think when you say Sharia law, most people might not really know what that entails. So let's say Simra and I have a collection and come in here and correct me if I'm wrong on any point. We have a collection of investments here and something was to happen to myself. Let's say me. Uh, all summer, yeah. Hopefully not. I'd rather it be myself. Let's say something happens to me and, okay, we have the assets remaining. So then what happens? So you might expect if you're watching this from the UK that, okay, they would then be passed to my spouse in this case, Summer. Whereas as I understand it with Sharia law, it would naturally, the assets would naturally be passed to, is it your male family member, your brother first? My understanding is it's male family member so so tom my brother brother. if you're watching this you're not complaining (laughs) yeah (laughs) however i don't think someone's going to be too happy i mean i wouldn't paint this picture too far no don't come after him tom please (laughs) no so that's just a quick topic we're certainly not claiming to be experts on that by any means but what we're saying is an spv amongst other things can allow you to have more control so have more control and operate within a system you're more familiar with i think as an overall summary I think ultimately all of these vehicles are just risk management, right? It's like having insurance on everything that you're working for and making sure that you've done everything you can to wrap your assets and your businesses and all of the money that's coming in in the best possible way to suit yourselves and the next generation, whatever else you're planning. We're also going to add chapters below the video because we're talking about a lot of different topics and we are kind of jumping between them. So we're going to label those. If you want to jump back and forth, you can actually click on the chapters. Just wanted to add that. So we went on a little bit of a tangent there, but I was starting to get into a holding company and the slight difference between SPV as well. So SPV, like we said, is a special purpose vehicle, tends to be created for a specific asset class or a specific reason, for example. A hold co is a bit more generic. So it's more of, I guess the parent company is probably the easiest way of explaining so that's basically what's at the top that owns all of the different asset classes so this isn't limited or created just for one purpose what do you mean when you say asset classes so different things whether it's a property whether it's shares in a business intellectual property any kind of asset class that you can own and make money from i guess could be watches could be cars could be yachts so are they individual businesses it or more just assets that you own? Anything. Okay. So it can be businesses. If you've got, for example, you guys have, am I allowed to say? Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. So for example, you guys have your business in the UK, your business in the UAE, properties in the UK, you know, some things going on in different countries as well. All of those things could be held under one hold co, regardless of where that is. 
So this is effectively the centralized place where all of the money comes back up to and you can use that money to create additional entities, purchase property, purchase a yacht. Yeah, now we're talking. That's the goal. We'll set one of them up. (laughs) So they work quite well to hold multiple different asset classes. Obviously, most people in the world know that in order to create long-standing wealth, you do need to diversify. So these work work quite well in terms of just centralizing everything and giving you that control to reinvest. It also protects you from a tax perspective as well. So the tax side of things, um, you've got some preferential rates there. You know, people pay themselves in dividends. It's not an invoicing entity. So it's not something where you're gonna be invoicing for an active service. Um, So it works quite well for a lot of clients who have multiple different asset classes or are planning to build in that direction. We've still got people that go down this route where the only asset class they've got are properties, which again is fine. It depends how you want the the entity structured. The kind of next level up to that is more the foundation. So a foundation is, trying to think easy way to describe this, is somewhere between a trust and a holding company. Do you guys know what a trust is? I think in the UK, we're quite familiar with trusts anyway, but just well, to like give a bit really more clarity. Well, really wealthy people put stuff in trust. So. You don't have to be super wealthy. Like it works so it's for protected normal people when they as pass well. away. Yeah, effectively. So a trust is effectively a contractual agreement. So it's when someone transfers a legal ownership, all their assets to the trust and highlights where these assets will go. Whereas a foundation is somewhere between a trust and a company. So how I typically explain it to most of my clients, just to make it super easy, is think of how a holding company works and then think of a trust. Protects you from the legalities and your longer term wishes. There's some tax benefits definitely there as well. So that combined with a hold co where you've actually got a bit more flexibility and a bit more movement on the day to day and you know expanding to it, mesh those together and that's pretty much a foundation. Got it. Okay. So my initial question is what sort of net worth or how many assets do people have when they set up these holding? There's no rule to it. If someone's got one property, there's not any kind of expectation or anything as a minimum that you'd need. For example, if we leave the UAE tomorrow and we've got a property here, even if it's one that we're living in, and then we decide, okay, I'm going to rent it long term or I'm going to stick it on Airbnb and make some money that will still work for us, especially where we're going, if we're going back to the UK, it's not very nice from an income tax perspective. So again, this can be reinvested without ever coming directly to us. Obviously, if we need to release any of the funds, the tax implications are there, but the vehicle will work for pretty much anywhere, anyone for different reasons. You don't have to be absolutely wealthy. So am I right in thinking there with the SPV? For example, if you own that Airbnb listing Mm -hmm. and you're living in the UAE, you wouldn't face any income tax. But in the example, if you move back to the UK and you're a UK resident again, you do. So you would be paying tax on that rental income. Alternatively, if the SPV owns a property, the money can remain within the UAE and therefore not be liable to personal tax. Got it. Obviously, every country's rules are different and you need to gain some local tax advice in any situation. But it's the same as like with an SPV, a holding company, a foundation, the money just goes back in and it can be used to do whatever it needs to be done. And we all know when you have investments to create real long-term wealth, the goal is to reinvest the profits. That's how we grow. So having that asset income come into the SPV, you can then reinvest in the UAE purchase another property or another type of asset, whatever asset class you're focusing on. Or a yacht. Or a yacht, yeah. (laughs) Perhaps not the best investment. Is that what they do? Is they buy a yacht? I mean, this this seems to be Matt's dream today. Yeah, (laughs) well, a yacht is the dream. So it's uh, perhaps not the best investment though. But I think it's a good example too, because a yacht I think is the, when you think of the wealthy setting up trusts and foundations and whole companies, I think a yacht is what comes to mind because they're typically kept within those, aren't they? So. Like, who is the type of person that sets these holding foundation things up? Really anyone. So there's not a right or wrong kind of profile. 
everyone's got different benefits. Obviously, there are so many different passports in the world. There are so many different asset classes. There are so many different countries with different rules. So it's not, oh, you have to be worth five million pounds to be able to set one of these up. It's not that at all. Someone with one property in the Middle East uh, with a certain kind of passport could benefit from this. Someone with multiple businesses could benefit benefit from this someone with one could someone you know there's not really a right or wrong it's very bespoke but I'm guessing you kind of want a bit of a real life example of kind of what we could do um trying to think who have I worked with recently so I had a client recently who wanted to create some anonymity shall we say remove their name from the businesses not owning it 100 percent themselves, uh, remove some of the liability um, and segregate some of the liability as well. So, you know, I think we touched earlier on some more high risk industries that can potentially spill over to the owner's personal life if something was to go wrong. So if we can help avoid that, then great. But this particular client uh, deals in oil and gas, for example, and multiple different businesses as well. So the plan was to remove his name as an individual, have a hold co. This hold co would then own multiple different SPVs. Below those SPVs are the different industries. So even if he's got two businesses in oil and gas, that could be under one SPV, for example, uh, marketing. I'm elaborating a little bit on what we did for him, but that's one type of structure, for example. The and so are those businesses, sorry to interrupt, okay. just thinking of a question, in different countries or are they all in the UAE? So most of them were here. There were a couple outside of the UAE. So they can still fall within the same hold go. And the holding company, you said it's not attached to their name. It's just... So it's still, they, they own they the hold own co, it. yeah. But right. then obviously the SPVs are old, owned by the hold co. Got it, okay. So it would be hold, holding company, which is owned by... Summer and Matt, for example, okay. then you'd have SPVs, which are owned by the Holdco. So, so with just, the day-to-day -day business that's doing the trading activity, issuing invoices, that's the operating entering company. agreements, yeah, that's the operating company. Yeah. And you're not going to then see, it's not going to be as, not going to be as easy to see who the high level owner is. No. So for example, you've got a marketing company. This marketing company is owned by an SPV. That SPV will have the director who obviously makes the decisions for anything owned by this SPV. So it effectively stops there. Then the ultimate owner of each of the SPVs, for example, is a hold co. Now we've covered a lot today. Personally, I've really enjoyed it. I'm very grateful, Shalyn, for your time today. Every time we sit together, I learn something new. And for me, it's about discovering this information. I can then go and do further research listen to what's applicable to me, and then most importantly, reach out to Shellen. So I wanna say whatever point in your own journey you're at, whether you're someone who now has multiple businesses, would like to consider SPVs, hold co's, trusts, foundations, Shellen is definitely the one to go to. If you're also at the start of your journey and you'd like to make the most of the opportunity within the UAE, be that be setting up a free zone company, a mainland, investing in asset classes here, there are a lot of options available and we're on this journey ourselves. So I definitely recommend you to head to the top of the description, fill out the very quick Google form to get in touch directly with you, Shelley. Thank you guys for having me again. I'm actually getting used to this now. Still don't understand how you do it every day, but I'm getting more and more used to the filming. And if you do need some help, just reach out and I'll happily support you and answer any questions that you've got.